Well, 10 years, it's quite a long time. 10 years, a decade, marks something pretty significant in people's lives. As a kid, it marks the change from being in the single digits to being double digits. When you're a kid, that's a pretty big deal. Depending on your age, 10 years can mark either one half, one third, one fourth, even up to one tenth of your entire life. Popular television shows rarely make it 10 years. One of the most popular shows ever, the show called Seinfeld, only lasted nine years. Just recently, another popular show called The Office, that ended after nine years. The beloved Star Trek, the original series, was only three years. And cult classic Firefly lasted 14 episodes. Ten years is quite the accomplishment. So for the past little while, as I approached my own 10-year anniversary of ordination, I've been thinking about that. And I want to say thank you to Alicia uh, and Larry, who conspired to celebrate that without me, without me knowing that. But I've been thinking about the significance of that milestone, particularly when the Wall Street Journal publishes that the average person will change their careers between five to seven times. What is it about church and ministry that has caused me to spend close to one-third of my entire life in ordination? What is more, when it's all said and done, and I retire at 65, I will have spent 41 years in ordained ministry, which at that point will be 63% of my entire life. So this morning, I want to do something just a little bit different. Uh, instead of looking at the specific readings of, for the day, which we normally do, I want to look at some of the main things that I think God has taught me over the past 10 years. What are the three convictions, core convictions, that not only have led me to a life in ministry, but also grounded my life of faith as well? And obviously I hope that these three convictions are not just for myself, but are also for you all as well. So firstly, we live out our Christian life in the context of community. I didn't always think that. I thought that, you know, my life of faith was about me. It was about what I internally believed and felt in my mind and my heart, and I was kind of doing the church a favor by sitting in the pews every Sunday. The community of faith is not just important, it's vital to our faith. Scripture knows nothing about the solitary life of faith. From the beginning, God establishes community time and time again. Creates Adam and then says to Adam, it's not good for Adam to be alone. And so he creates Eve, a partner, a helpmeet, a companion to walk with him. He calls Abraham to establish a nation. The first thing that Jesus does when he bursts on the scene is call a band of followers around him. Jesus says to the disciples that in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus promises that where two or three are gathered together, he will be there. Have you ever wondered, why did Jesus choose those numbers? Why not eight or nine? Why not when 20 of you are gathered, I will be there? Why two or three? Well, two is the fewest amount of people that you can have before you are alone. Two is the smallest unit of community. We can get in the trap of thinking that our life of faith is lived alone. It doesn't involve anybody else, and we keep it all inside. It's a private matter, something that I, I don't share with anybody else. Or we can think that the life of faith is just about ticking the appropriate boxes. When I announced to my friends way, way long time ago that I was becoming a priest, I had tons of friends tell me about how they were baptized in the church. Well, I was baptized in this church, or I was baptized in that church. Or they would say, you know, I went to church once with my grandma when I was five. It seemed good to them that in some manner they could tick that box. Well, I've been baptized, or I've been to church once, so that must mean I'm Christian. 
in some kind of odd way. See, but that never established a participation in the community of faith. And it's in the context of community that we are stretched, that we are challenged, that we're edified, we're comforted in our life of faith. Yes, we all have individual experiences of God, but those experiences are not for ourselves. They're not just for ourselves. They're for each other. God works in our lives, and sometimes the way God works in our lives is via other people. Sometimes our presence, our experiences, our words can be the very answer to prayer for someone across the aisle. So I hope you don't mind, but I want to ask you a few questions. And I want to invite you to raise your hand if these things apply to you. And as you do, I want you to look around. And I want you to see the other people who raised their hands as well. Have you ever gone through the death of a loved one? Gone through the death of a loved one? Have you ever felt that for whatever reason, God didn't love you? Anyone? Have you ever prayed without receiving the results that you were praying for? Have you ever felt less than good enough? Have you ever doubted your faith or even that God is real in the first place? Notice the people who raised their hands. How limited is our life of faith when we don't realize that we are part of such a dynamic family that is spiritually equipped to help us. One of the saddest things that I see, that I spiritually see, is when people say that they have a faith in God, but they lack any involvement with community. Because what happens is they have the fire of faith in them, but then it goes smaller and smaller and smaller and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, until eventually it's barely recognizable at all. Scripture says that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We are surrounded by people who are witnesses to be able to speak into our lives the reality of God's presence, even when we don't see it. Now, we all go through hard times. We all go through times of questionings and doubts, and sometimes life bears its ugly teeth at us, and we just don't know how to cope. But the great strength of the community of faith, the strength of the church, is when we don't believe that we belong, when we don't believe that God is there for us, when we don't believe that we are loved or even forgiven, we let the community of faith believe it for us and love us enough to bring us back to the place where we can believe it once again. The community of faith to which we are called not just to attend, but to participate in, is of vital importance to our life of faith. The second conviction is that Jesus matters. That should probably be the first conviction, but it fits better here. Second conviction, Jesus matters. We live in a world where the language of God is thrown around by every single belief system. Nowadays, when you hear somebody say, oh, I believe in God, 